We hope you guys had an amazing week last week, an amazing Thanksgiving. Um, and now that Thanksgiving uh, can be checked off the list, uh, you can officially say that the Christmas season has begun, except for us, because our daughter, Blake, if you... If you're not new to MMC, you probably know this because we mention it every year. Uh, but if you're somewhat new, you need to understand that our, our daughter, Blake, for her, Christmas has no end. Uh, it, is, it is a year-round experience. Um, we listen to Bobby Buble and Bing Crosby and Pentatonix in the summertime. I associate those songs with summer camp because we listen to them in July a lot. Uh, she just, she loves Christmas. And so... For us, you know, we don't really look forward to Christmas. We live it every single day of the calendar year. Uh, we get to celebrate it all year long, unlike uh, normal people. But now that we're all on the same calendar page, Merry Christmas. You know, we're all here in 2023 and, and, and closing in very quickly. On How many of you have already decorated your houses? Yeah, Boy, go, I'm oh, with yeah. you. You know what? It takes so much work to decorate. I'm like, let's just do it as soon as Halloween is over. Blake, she begs literally all summer. So I just gave in this year. I'm like, I don't care. Put it up in October. Let's go. <laughs> so like now it's like official. I feel like a weirdo. Like those people who do that, but like, it's okay. It's Christmas time. So if you're like most of us, you're counting down to the big day Christmas is coming, okay? And if you're like us, pulling off that big day, it has to be very um, strategic. It has to be really coordinated, especially with a family our size. And um, so, so tell me, I'm going to kind of run through this three-stage strategy for Christmas, and I just want you to kind of just tell me if this resonates with you. Tell me if this is kind of you and your family. So the, so the first step or the first phase or stage to this process is the planning stage, or you got to devise a plan, right? And that plan might consist of compiling a list of those that you're going to be shopping for, family, friends, coworkers. The second part of this strategy uh, would be the, um, the, the preparation. So you revisit your budget. Okay, we do because there's been many times we arrive in January bankrupt because we just <laughs> lose our mind and just start buying gifts and then realize, hey, hey we, we don't have any more money. That's fun. Um, and then, you know, so you know, you know the drill. You shop until you drop and, and you, you hide the presents, you wrap the presents, and then you hide them better because like when our kids were little, they would find them. And so you got to hide them even better. And then you put them under the tree the closer you get to the big day. Okay, but then the final stage of all this uh, orchestrated, you know, um, system that we have to have is, is the giving of the present itself. When the big day arrives, you, uh, you get that big rush of joy as you watch your kids or your family, your loved ones, your wife, whoever it may be open that present. And how many of you guys just love the thrill and the rush of watching them enjoy the, the thing that you have prepared for them and planned for them? Do you love, raise, your, raise your hand if you love giving gifts. You love that joy that comes with making someone you love happy. Okay, your payout is their pleasure, right? Yeah. Okay, so does this sound familiar to you, this, this process? Okay, so, um, so though it sounds familiar to us, this is a, 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 th a three-stage strategy. That's kind of a tongue twister a little bit. But it's not just practical, and it's not really just in the Christmas season, you know. Um, this is actually way more than practical. It's actually very spiritual. But spiritually speaking, God implemented a very similar strategy um, the very first Christmas that ever took place. And instead of it really taking a month for him to pull off like it takes us, um, or even a year, uh, nonetheless, it took him thousands of years to prepare for the first Christmas ever. And might I just add that the first Christmas was by far the best Christmas that has ever transpired, and it will trump all Christmases that will ever happen after it because of what transpired on that day. The Chris, first Christmas was legit. The first Christmas was the best Christmas of all time. No one really knows how to do Christmas better than the one who invented it. Would you agree? The moment we begin, here's what we need to understand. To understand the significance of this timeless celebration, it's unfathomable to think of Christmas the same way again. So today we're going to really kick off for you a very special uh, series that we're calling the Countdown to Christmas. And today we're going to bring you part one we're calling The Plan. So when you think about Christmas, you've got to understand right out of the chute that Christmas came about as a solution to a problem. And in order to understand the problem, 
that God was solving, you gotta go all the way back to the very beginning. You know, a lot of times we think about the Christmas story and we automatically go to the gospels because that's where Jesus is born. We go to Matthew, we go to Luke chapter two. That's what we read on Christmas morning. That's what we're looking at over the Christmas season. You know, we download the version plan and we're reading along, but you really gotta go all the way back to the book of Genesis. That's where it's all laid out. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna go to Genesis chapter three. And in just a moment, I'm gonna start reading in verse three. I'll give you a second to get there, but I wanna kinda lay out what happened. So in the first three chapters, we basically see the creation of the world. God then creates Adam and Eve, drops them into a perfect world, into this beautiful garden. He gives them all of this beautiful garden. You can eat anything you like, except for this one tree right here in the middle. Don't eat from that one. But you probably know the story, even if you've never been in church. You know that Adam and Eve blew it. You know that the enemy came in, he tempted them, they took the bait, and we know it as the fall of man. But what I want to show you is that this is where Christmas actually comes from in this passage. So let's go. Genesis chapter 3, let's start reading in verse 3. And it says this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Just pause for just a moment right here. You know, we just came out of the series, Defending Your Faith. We've been talking about doing warfare with the enemy. And this is the first thing that you need to realize how the enemy works. The enemy came to Eve and he asked her a question. He asked her to question what God had said. He didn't just say, hey, go grab the fruit. Doesn't it look wonderful? Like it looks so good, so juicy, you should get it. That's not what he did. He said, did God really say that? He caused her to pause and think about and question the word of God. Same tactic he uses on you and I today. Same thing that's happening in our culture with our kids right now. Did God really say that? Maybe it's not that big of a deal. We've come a long way. You know, maybe the church is just kind of old fashioned. Don't think so. Go on to the next verse. Of course, we may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do you will die. Now here he goes again. The serpent says, you won't die. You won't die. God knows your eyes will be open. And as soon as you eat it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I want you to think about for just a moment, the very reason that the enemy was kicked out. Lucifer was an angel in heaven. He was kicked out of heaven for one reason. He wanted to be God, right? Now, if I were to ask you to just raise your hand if you would like to be God, nobody in here is going to raise your hand unless you weren't paying attention when I asked the question. That could happen. I mean, I feel bad for people that don't listen. But the fact is, we're not going to do that. But yet, we actually do that in our own life. You see, when we try to take control of our own life, what we're doing is we're saying, God, I want to be you. That's exactly what the serpent was telling her in this moment. He was saying, no, 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 no. That's not what God says. That's not what he meant. The fact is the second you eat that fruit, you're going to be like God. And so what does she do? Go on to the next verse. The woman was convinced. That's all it took. Little conversation with the enemy. She saw the tree. It was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit, she ate it, and then she gave some to her husband. Notice the next part, it says, who was with her the whole time. This is a message for another day. But you know, the husband was right there. A lot of things could have changed on that day had Adam stepped up and been a man and had recognized, (laughs) recognized my wife is having conversation with the enemy, right? But he doesn't. He lets Eve have a conversation, even begin to question what the word of God said. What did God say? He could have said like, Eve, come on, come on, come on. We got to go. Like, do you know you're talking to a snake? I mean, come on now. Although the animals may be all we're talking, who knows? We're being very critical of Adam. But the fact is, he was there. He was standing right there the whole time. So a lot of times we blame it all on Eve, but he was right there. It says, then he took and he ate it. 
verse 7, at that moment, their eyes were open. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed together fig leaves to cover themselves. Verse 8, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. I love this part because this shows obviously what their nightly routine had been up to this point. That in the cool of the evening, they would take a stroll with Jesus. If you know the passage in Exodus that says Moses is having a conversation with God and he's begging God, I want to see you. He so longed, so hungry for God. And God said, no one can see my face, right? No one can see my face and live. So he passes by and lets Moses see his backside. And so in this passage, you're like, well, wait a second. This says God came down in the cool of the day. Well, this would have been a Christophany. This would have been Jesus coming down in the cool of the day and walking among his people. The close-knit relationship that he had was so beautiful. But in this moment, notice what he does. He shows up to go for their evening stroll. And it says this, then the Lord God called to them and said, where are you? Obviously, God knew where they were. It's like a toddler who's done something wrong. You ever had your kid go and hide from you? You walk in, you obviously know where they are. They know they did something wrong. And the moment we do something wrong, we often want to just run and hide. And that's what they were doing. He replies, I heard you walking. This is Adam talking. I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? He knew they had done that. But you know what he was trying to do? He wanted them to admit and confess with their own mouth what they had done. Because there cannot be real change in your life until you're actually willing to admit that you did something wrong. And so he wanted them to say it. But notice what happens next. The man replies... It was the woman. It was that woman. And then notice this. Not only was it the woman, but then he points the blame towards God. It was that woman that you gave me. She made me do it. Now, how many of you guys just know it is in our DNA to blame other people? Is it not? Like, yes. You can all just nod your head because I know I can't get you all to raise your hand. I'm feeling like this is getting a little personal this morning. (laughs) I don't know. But at the same time, we we have to admit that men really haven't changed in thousands of years, right? (laughs) Okay, so I got to tell you a story, okay? Well, clearly, I mean, she's the one that ate the fruit and you created her. So, like, I'm just standing here. I mean, I I don't know what this whole, like, world falling apart and sin is all about. I think that's why God put that note in there. The way I see it. I don't know. (laughs) I think that's why God put that note in there who was with her, right? Because he knew Adam was was going to play the blame game. This last weekend, you know, it was Black Friday. How many of you guys go out and did Black Friday? I mean, now it's kind of like we do it more as a tradition because you can get everything online too. But my girls and I, we like to go out. We like to get a coffee and just see the crazy crowd, okay? And so we went out. I'm the designated driver. Right. That's what I do. Okay, he just told on himself, okay? I'm going to tell you this story. So Brad is the designated driver. He's got one job, right? What is it? He got one job. I know whose side they're going to be on. Okay. So we tell him where we want to go. It's his job to get us there. And all the while I am on my phone and I'm shopping online. Okay. While he's taking us to the next place we want to go. So Brad is doing the driving now. In his defense, he said, miss, will you put the directions on your phone? And I did. And then I clicked back on to my shopping. Everybody has a job. Everybody's got a job. I'm the driver and I have a navigator. All right. Okay. Okay. So I told him where we wanted to go. The girls wanted their coffee. We'd been the first place. Now they're ready for some coffee. We got to have some caffeine. So he's been there many, many times before. We were in Arkansas. (laughs) Yes, he has. Not this part of Arkansas. I didn't know where we were. But sometimes, sometimes. In my defense. ADD kicks in. Which, by the way. He gets a little distracted. In case you didn't know, this story is not in the notes. (laughs) Who cares? Do you have a slide for this? It's a great story. Okay. Okay. It has a point. So long story short, Brad is driving. My head is down. I'm shopping. And all of a sudden I look up and I'm like, where are we? And he was like, I don't know. You've got the GPS on your phone. And I'm like, what? No, Brad, you are so far off. And we had gone like 15 minutes out of the way in the wrong direction. Okay. I didn't recognize anything. And all of a sudden, 
I'm getting frustrated because I just lost 15 minutes of getting good deals. And so I'm like, Brad, what are you doing? And immediately he pulls an Adam. Okay. He just pulls straight an Adam and he's like, what? It's not my fault. I'm like just you here. have I'm the just GPS driving. on your phone. And I'm like, girls, dad has one job. What's dad's job? They're like to drive dad. You're supposed to get it there. And the next thing I know, Brad, you'd be so disappointed. He just goes off on me. Running his mouth, and I'm like, that is Dear not. Jesus, what is wrong with you, Brad? You're just blaming me. Go ahead, God. Get her. And Get her. in that moment, You're I'm lying. thinking to myself, like, he is bl- he is actually blaming me right now. Like, he's the one driving, he's the one that went in the wrong direction. How in the world is this my fault? Okay. And so in that moment, I get ready. You got nothing to say? In that moment, I get ready to like say something back. And all of a sudden I realize like, this is going to get us nowhere. This is literally like, it's that breaking moment in a relationship where you can ruin the whole day or you can do what the psalmist said and you can just shut your mouth. Now, Praise the Lord. for you some know, of us, I'm just saying for some of us, it is definitely harder than for others. Okay. But prior so to this, that, that is not what I remember you saying. That's not how I remember it, how I perceived it. How many of you guys know there's two sides to every story? What I heard you say was... <laughs> and I was like, whoa, hey. I don't know what that was, but the vibe that you're sending out right now is making me feel very uncomfortable. That's how I remember it. If you're single in this room, you now understand how men think. I didn't sound anything like that. I didn't hear but a word here you was said. the fact. I realized in that moment, I have a choice. I can either sit here and play the blame game or I can just be quiet. And so I take a deep breath and I also realize I got two little girls in the back and they're not so little anymore, but I got girls in the back and I'm not gonna be a very good example if I do what I wanna do, okay? We just like just tell them what I think. So I took a deep breath, literally steam's coming out of my ears. I'm breathing. I'm trying to control my breathing, right? I'm getting hot just now, just thinking about it. And so I just sit there and I just listen as he talks and he tells me that it was my fault. And then out of the corner of my eye, I catch one of my girls in the back and they're smiling because they realize how much self-control I am exercising in that moment. You did good. But the fact is, it is human nature to play that blame game. And that's what Adam did. But Adam did not just blame Eve, which naturally blame your wife. That's what you're going to do. But he also then blames God. But check it out. Notice what she does. We go on to the next verse and it says, then the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? And check out hers. It's the serpent. It's his fault. He's the reason I took the bait and I ate the devil the made fruit. me do it. And you know, the fact Classic is guys. Move. Classic. We have not changed. (laughs) We have not changed very much from the very beginning. The very reason that God instituted a plan for Christmas was to solve a problem. And that problem was sin. It's the very thing that we have now dealt with since that moment. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Why? Because when Adam and Eve chose to sin, when they chose to disobey, what they did is it now came into the bloodline of all humanity. And the fact is, is that sin, the reason it's so bad is that sin brings a separation between us and God. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse two tells us this. It says, it's your sin that have cut you off from God. Because of your sin, he has turned away and will not listen any more. You see, in that moment, God had told them if they were to partake of the fruit, that death would be the result. Not just a physical death, not just their bodies dying physically, although that's part of the curse, but a spiritual death, a separation from God. And so in that moment, God immediately begins to institute a plan that leads us on this countdown to Christmas. I want to show you in a snapshot what God's plan really was. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says this, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, this is where he's about to lay down some consequences, okay? 
Because you have done this, you are more cursed than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. Now, I want you, before I even read 15, I want you to think for just a moment. What was God's original plan in creating humanity? God's original plan was to have a relationship with his people. That's what he ultimately wanted. Satan hated God, hates God because he was kicked out of heaven. Hates anyone that would love God. And so what was Satan ultimately trying to do? Break the relationship, sever the relationship because he knew that would break God's heart. And so as we look at verse 15, this is truly the plan laid out. It says this, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This verse, guys, is the first messianic prophecy that we see in the word of God. It literally is the first gospel. This is known as the proto-evangelium. That's a big word, but it simply means this. Protos is a Greek word meaning first and evangelium meaning good news or gospel. And so when you see this verse, what you're literally seeing is the entire plan of salvation, the gospel message in one verse. And you say, how so? Will you jump back to the verse for me? I'm gonna lay it out. When you look at this, you see the prophecy goes down like this. He will strike your head. Who is he? This is talking about the offspring of the woman. And this is a prophecy of Jesus crushing the head of Satan. When do we see that happen? Well, you fast forward long past Christmas and we see that that crushing came on the cross. And then it says that he will bruise his heel. And that is that Satan, yes, he may have bruised. Jesus had to go through a lot on the cross. But ultimately, what was the purpose of all of that was redemption. What is redemption? Redemption means to buy back. And so when you think about this word, you're like, well, what was he buying back? He was buying back you and me because sin is a legal problem. And so when sin entered the human race, when sin entered the picture, there had to be a penalty paid for sin. Just like if you go out and you break the law, there is a penalty because you broke a legal law. You're gonna to have to pay a ticket. Anybody's ever had to? Pastor Grant's right back there so he knows the truth, right? Don't lie in church. We all have, when we've made those mistakes. And so God immediately institutes from the moment sin enters the picture. Here's what is amazing. Are there gonna be consequences for our poor choices? The answer is yes. But immediately God shows his love and his grace and his mercy all wrapped up in this one verse when he shows that Jesus Christ is going to come, right? He's gonna come on the scene. He's gonna crush the head of the enemy. And then you notice the part of this verse says the hostility. There will be hostility between her offspring and his offspring. And what is that talking about? That there was now going to be this good and evil play throughout all of history until the very end when the enemy is conquered. And right now, we still struggle with that. That's what the enemy tries to get each and every day is for us to give in, to break covenant with Almighty God. But I want you to notice the very next thing that he does in his plan, you see it in verse 21, and it says this, the Lord God made clothing from the animal skins for Adam and his wife. In this moment, what God did is the first sacrifice. He took an innocent animal and he sacrificed it and that animal shed its blood to cover temporarily Adam and Eve in that moment. This became the first sacrifice for the next hundreds of years, we would see animal sacrifices to temporarily cover sin, but that was not anything more than a temporary fix. God's ultimate fix was going to be to send his one and only son, Jesus Christ into the world, born of a virgin, we know the story, laid in a manger, lived a perfect, sinless, spotless life. And as John tells us, became the lamb of God who would not only cover, but take away the sins of the world, doing what? Giving you and I an opportunity to have relationship with almighty God. You know, in the same way that God has had a plan for humanity, 
This is something that you need to understand today. Whether you have been serving God for one day or 50 years, you need to understand that God has a plan for you. I know if, you've, if you're in church a lot, you hear that a lot and it can almost become white noise, but you really need to understand the significance of what is being said in this statement. God has a plan for you. And the reality is, is you may have made a mess of your life or at minimum, you may have made some really messy decisions. How many of you guys have made some messy decisions, right? And the reality is, is God is so quick to forgive. He's so quick to welcome us back. Misty said it so well. All he really wants, that the essence of his big plan for all of us on both sides of salvation, right, is him. He wants you to come to him. Adam and Eve made a mess of their situation. But in, in the end of it all, really what God wanted is just, just come back. What, did they, what was their first response? It was to hide. And, and don't we do that? It's, you know, even as believers, when we make mistakes, we, we, we flub up and we, we, we make a mess. The first thing that we want to do is we want to give in and listen to the enemy. Listen to me. He, he tells you that, that you're not worthy right. of hearing from God. You're not worthy of being forgiven by God for what you've done. And it's just simply not the truth. It's absolutely a lie. The first thing the enemy wants you to do is he wants you to hide when God says no. I don't want you to hide. I want you to come running back to the Father. I want you to come running back to me and say, Dad, I messed up. I need you. I need your help. One of my favorite stories is one that Misty tells of when she was younger. She's about 16 years old. And she was leaving after a game at the church at her school. And she was driving this, you know, big, mom's big conversion van. And she was, couldn't really see very well in the mirrors. It was nighttime. And as she's backing up, she, she backs over the top practically of a little truck that was behind her. People are laughing. That's funny. And you know, of course, she's terrified. As any 16 year old girl would be, she'd had no clue what to do. She was horrified at what she had done. What's the first thing that she did though? She went to her father. She went to her dad. She said, dad, I've done, I, I've done something really bad. And I, I don't know what to do. I need your help. And you know, unlike what some dads may have done, here's what her dad did. And he's just a great, great man, incredible man of God. He said, go home. I'll take care of it. And you know, there's consequences for our decisions. We make messy decisions as, you know, unbelievers, as believers, we make messy decisions and we have to, you know, lie in the bed that we make for ourselves. But we serve an awfully good father yes, who says, come on, just come back to me. Yeah. Just admit that you messed up. Admit yeah. that you made a mistake. Yeah. And I'm going to make it better. I'm gonna make it okay, even when it's really not okay. And you know, I love what 2 Peter 3 and 9 says. This is really God's plan. I think this is a great scripture that just captures his plan or at least his Christmas wish for all of us, that, that none would perish, that none would perish in their hiding, that none would run off because of the messy mistakes they've made, that they've made and they hide in the bushes and they die there in their hidden sins. Don't do that. Don't run, don't hide, come to me. Come all of you who are, who are heavy laden or weary or tired or worn out from doing this thing called life, from making messy decisions, come to me, come to me. And I'll make you new again, I'll give you rest. God always has a plan, even though you can't always see it. God always has a plan. And here's what you really need to know as part of his plan, you need to know what Ephesians 2 and 10 says, for you are God's masterpiece. You need to understand this. You need to understand it's not because of anything that you've ever done or anything that you will ever do. You need to hear with your human ears today, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching online today, you are God's masterpiece. There is none like you. God cannot even put a value 
on you. You are so priceless to him. You have no earthly idea how much God loves you. He has created you anew in Christ. He has given you a new life. He's given you new hope. He's given you a new name in heaven. He has done all of these wonderful things for you so that you can do the good things that he planned for you long ago. You know what God does for us through his incredible plan? He extends to us his grace and his mercy. Do you know what that is? You know the difference? God's grace is when he gives us the things that we don't deserve. I can think of one word that describes everything that I don't deserve. Jesus. I don't deserve him. I can think of so many things I don't deserve. But because of his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. And his mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. You know, Misty talked about it. We all deserve death. We all deserve a spiritual and a physical death sentence because our sins have separated us from God. But then there was our Father who loves us so much. He has made you His workmanship. He has made you priceless in His sight. You see, even Christians, so many of us spend most of our lives searching for significance, the the plan of God, if you will. When God is trying to get you to see your significance, you don't need to search for it once you've come to Christ. You have it. It's who you are, and it's because of Christ in you that now you are significant because of Him. You don't need to look for it. You see, the answer, the plan, all of it comes down to Him. He wants you to come to Him. He wants you to be hungry for Him. Satan wants to draw you away and entice you by by those things that you desire and and try to cause you to to think in your mind that you don't have significance, but you do. See, Adam and Eve, they had all the significance in the garden. And she got him to, 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 he got her to look around. The enemy was able to get Eve to look around at what she couldn't have. And he convinced her that what she had wasn't good enough. But everything that God has given you is more than enough. It's more than you could ever ask for, imagine, or think. He has blessed you with so much. Stop thinking that you need to step out and look for the plan of God in your life. You don't. You need to come to Him and live a life of right positioning in Him and learn to be still and know that He is God and learn to hear and listen to God and be obedient to God. And then when you learn how to do that, Scripture says that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of God. You see, you don't have to go out looking for your calling. You don't have to go look for your purpose or God's plan. God's plan finds you when you just rest in His presence and you find Him to be sufficient and more than enough. He's all you will ever need if you'll just rest in God and in His plan. His plan finds you. Do you think Misty and I like drummed all this up and we made this happen? We could have never imagined what God would do with us out here in the middle of nowhere. This wasn't our plan. We were just simply being obedient. We were just simply taking it one step at a time because we were in Christ. We just wanted to obey our our, our heavenly father. We just wanted to please him and to know him. And when you do that, I'm telling you, he just starts to bring alignment to your life and things just start to come together. And before you know it, you get so far down that path and you don't even recognize your life because of what obedience will do. You just get in sync with God and what he has for you. Begin to listen to him and just obey every step. Just obey him. And you won't even recognize your life. God not only has a plan for humanity, God has a plan for you. Let's pray today. Father, thank you, God, that you have a plan. For each and every one of us in this room, thank you that you have a plan for every person watching online today. Thank you, God. You have given us forgiveness. You've given us grace and mercy, love. You've blessed us beyond what we could ever imagine. God, thank you that you have a plan for us. We praise you today, God, for that. We thank you. 
with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, you need to understand God's plan of salvation. You know he loves you. You know that you're a workmanship, but it's only in Christ. He wants to adopt you as a son, a daughter of God. He's created you in his image and in his likeness, but he wants you to step in to who he has called you to be through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of his resurrection. He has so much for you. You have no idea what is on the other side of surrender, but that's what it's going to take. Yielding yourself, transferring control of your life and giving it to God. Can you do that today? Aren't you tired of doing life your way? Haven't you realized that you playing God doesn't work? That there's only one true God? It is only Him that we should serve. It is only Him that we should seek. And so today I want to invite you, whether you're watching online or you're in this house today, I want to invite you to surrender your life to Him. Give Him full control. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins believe Jesus is the son of God. It's only through him you can be saved. Confess with your mouth Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. With heads bowed and eyes closed in this room, if you're making that decision today, we're going to pray this prayer together as a church family. But before we do, I want to know who we're praying with today. So if that's you, would you just raise your hand nice and high so I can see your hand today? Thank you. Up in the bleachers, I see you too. Anyone else today? Thank you, I see your hand on my left. Three people giving their lives to Jesus. Anybody else today? Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Three people giving their lives to Jesus. Thank you, God. If you're watching online right now, I want you just to comment all in in the comment section below so we know you're making that decision. And we're gonna pray this prayer together as a church family. Let's pray this. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart, Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, God, for your plan of salvation. Thank you that you've given me grace and hope and a future. In Jesus' name, amen.